Our next speaker is Lawrence Wood, who is a supervising attorney at the Legal Assistance Foundation of Metropolitan Chicago. Uh, Lawrence also wrote the bench book, which will be included in the materials available on the web uh, for you after the conference. And uh, Larry also teaches a course on housing law at the University of Chicago. So, Larry Wood. Thank you. Um, since I do teach, I'm used to being interrupted all the time by my students, so I will take questions. You don't have to wait till the end. At my class, I never get two minutes into a lecture before uh, my students are objecting, and questioning, and challenging, so I'm uh, very used to that. Uh, I'm with the Legal Assistance Foundation of Metropolitan Chicago. Just a little bit about my agency. We're the largest provider of free legal services to the indigent uh, in the Midwest. We have over 80 attorneys, and we represent uh, clients not only in housing cases, but in consumer matters, employment matters, uh, family law matters, immigration. Um, and the reason I mention this to all of you is because if you are interested in getting involved, you can. We have a private attorney involvement project, and we get about $400,000 a year that is just for that project. And we can't spend that money unless private attorneys are calling us and saying that they want to co-counsel cases with us. So if you're interested in doing any of the work that we do, if you're interested in practicing property law, if you're interested in getting into court, call us up. Uh, we can get you into co-counsel on a case. We'd be very interested in having you do that. Uh, in the housing area, most of the work that I do is on behalf of the residents of subsidized housing. And Hank has asked me not to talk about that uh, because it would take too long. Um, but the reason I mention it, uh, and, and residents of subsidized housing are CHA residents, public housing residents, residents of Section 8 pocket-based developments, and Section 8 voucher holders. Uh, the reason I mention it is because these cases are incredibly compelling because what's at risk is not just the apartment that the tenant is living in, but the rental assistance that runs with the unit. And so if tenants are evicted in these cases, they'll lose not just their home, they'll lose the rental assistance that they desperately need, and they will likely become homeless. Uh, again, if you're interested in helping us represent uh, these tenants, please call us. We will get you involved in these cases. Um, I can... Uh, all of you have pens. I'll just give out my number right now if you want to call me directly. My number is 773-572-3222. And I do want to talk, since I think part of my job here is to get you interested in these cases, to make you understand how compelling they are, I just want to talk about a couple of them. And these are all cases that have happened within the past year. I've been doing this work for 17 years, but I'm not reaching back to my first year to pick out the most compelling case. These cases are really representative of the kind of cases that come in. One case I want to mention was on behalf of an elderly woman who was at home one day when, whatever you want to call him, her boyfriend showed up uh, with another man that she didn't recognize. She let him into the unit, and the man that she didn't recognize took out a white powdery substance and started putting it on her table and dividing it up. And she was on the phone when he started doing this, and she said to him, you know, um, what are you doing? And uh, he confirmed that he that it was cocaine that he had. And she said, well, you can't do that in my apartment. You have to get out. And he refused. And so she left the unit and called the police. And the police met her outside her building. And she took the police up to her unit. She let the police into the unit. And the police arrested the person who was using the cocaine. They got her boyfriend out of the unit. And then the landlord gave her a termination notice, threatening to terminate her tenancy, and she lived in Section 8 project-based development because her guest, a person that she had voluntarily led into the unit, engaged in criminal drug-related activity. And if she were evicted, she would have lost her rental assistance, and she certainly would have been homeless. She was living just on disability benefits. And we tried to negotiate with the landlord we said, look, what you're essentially doing is you are threatening to evict somebody because they have reported a crime. And the landlord just said, look, the person was the guest. Uh, the lease allows us to evict her for the actions of her guest. And so what we did is 
we brought a counterclaim based on the Consumer Fraud Act. And I remember this case when David talked about using the Consumer Fraud Act. And we also relied on that case, Robinson, that David had mentioned. And we said, look, there's no misrepresentation in this case. But based on the elements of a Consumer Fraud Act claim that were set forth in the case that David mentioned, we said the landlord's actions in this case violate public policy because it's against public policy to punish people for reporting a crime. And we also said that we satisfy another element by showing that there would be terrible injury to this woman were she evicted because she would end up homeless. And finally, the landlord agreed to dismiss the eviction action if we dismissed our counterclaim. I'll just mention one other case because I think it was especially egregious. There's another woman who lived in a Section 8 project-based development. And one day, her fiancé came over to her unit and he beat the hell out of her. And she managed to call the police. And the police came over, came to the property manager. They came upstairs, got rid of the fiancé. And then they served this woman with a termination notice, again, holding her responsible for the criminal actions of her guest. And the termination notice was one of the most detailed that I've ever seen. The termination notices, and I'll discuss what they're generally like, they have to state the alleged violation with enough specificity to enable the tenant to prepare a defense. And this one was incredibly specific. It says, you called the police, and the police came to the property manager's office. We came to your unit. We knocked on your door. You answered your door. And when you answered your door, it was obvious that you had been beaten. That was the language in the termination notice. It said, your face was bleeding. It was covered with cuts. And it appeared that somebody had bitten your nose. This constitutes a violation of paragraph whatever of your lease agreement. Now, in this case, we again called the landlord, who was a different landlord this time, and said, you know, you've got to be kidding. I mean, talk about adding insult to actual injury. You can't do this. You cannot punish somebody for being the victim of a crime. And they said, well, look, the lease agreement says she's responsible for the criminal actions of her guest. This was her guest. She let her fiancé into the unit. And he certainly committed a violent crime by beating the hell out of her. And she is, therefore, responsible. So I still get angry when I think about this. There have been some lawyers, actually, in Massachusetts and in Oregon who have come up with an interesting defense in a case like this. They said that to have a policy of evicting victims of domestic violence because they are victims of domestic violence violates the Fair Housing Act, okay, because it discriminates against women. It was kind of an interesting theory. And they said, look, 98% of the victims of domestic violence are women. So if you have a policy of evicting victims of domestic violence simply because they're victims, then you're violating the Fair Housing Act's prohibition against sex discrimination. When I first read about this, I thought, you know, that's really interesting lawyering. It's very inventive. There's no way that that's going to go anywhere. But in those cases, they survived motions to dismiss and then settled. So I thought, well, what the hell, you know, give it a shot. And we filed the counterclaim. And the landlord requested three extensions over a period of three months to respond to our counterclaim. We couldn't. And then dismissed the case in exchange for our willingness to dismiss the counterclaim. Those counterclaims, thankfully, are no longer necessary, at least in the context of public housing and Section 8 housing. The Violence Against Women Act, the federal statute, has been amended to prohibit landlords from evicting the victims of domestic violence simply because they get beaten up. 